When the globe leapt into conflict in the late 1930s, governments around the world scoured for funding and materials that could be used for their nation's side of the fight. And as Germany unleashed its might and power against the Allies in Europe, top Third Reich officials enlisted an engineering marvel into their arsenal. The Junkers G-38 four-engine transport aircraft was the pride and joy of the Luftwaffe officials and worked in civilian operations for a decade. It featured a blended wing design where the body, fuselage, and wings merged with no clear dividing lines. In addition to being a novelty, this unique wing configuration allowed a few lucky passengers to get incredible scenic views from their seats on the wings. And during the earlier years of the conflict, the globally admired model participated in several bomber and transport roles, fighting for the Axis powers with all its might. Groundbreaking Wing Space During the interwar period, Junkers Aircraft and Motor Works was one of the mainstays of the German aircraft industry. Throughout the 1920s, the company's leader and aircraft engineering pioneer Hugo Junkers made several attempts to create a large-scale commercial transport. However, they had to be destroyed based on post-World War I Allied demands in the Treaty of Versailles, which prohibited Germany from developing aircraft with a certain amount of power or potential military applications. Still, Junkers persevered. Later in the decade, the German Design Bureau resumed the project as the G-40 transatlantic mail seaplane. Simultaneously, the Bureau also developed the G-38, a land plane version. After the project received financing from the Reich Air Ministry, the G-38 moved on to the construction stage. Structurally, the G-38 conformed to the standard Junkers approach and was covered in stressed, corrugated duraluminum, with the cockpit located in the streamlined bow of the fuselage. The German aircraft followed blended wing body design, in which a fixed wing aircraft's wing and body structures are smoothly blended together with no clear dividing line. This technology was pioneered by Louis de Monge and proved to be very maneuverable and quiet, despite its awkward appearance. The most outstanding feature of the G-38 aircraft was its ability to carry both payloads and passengers on its almost six-foot-thick wings. Junkers engineers took advantage of the massive blended wing and placed the aircraft's wing center section to accommodate a passenger cabin on each side. Besides the wings, the entire fuselage also offered a lot of space for freight and passengers, as it was easily accessible. The largest aircraft in the world. On November 6, 1929, the four-engine G-38 aircraft had its maiden flight in Dessau, northern Germany, flying for 45 minutes. The new Junkers model was the result of many of the Bureau's efforts to build a massive passenger aircraft, limited by the Versailles Treaty time and time again. At the time of its introduction, the G-38 was the largest aircraft in the world. With its size and revolutionary static design that allowed for payload compartments and the wings, the newest Junkers model was admired by fellow engineering companies and praised for its novelty. Then, after being registered with serial number 3301, and the identifier D-2000, the Reich Air Ministry purchased the first G-38 model for demonstration flights. Delivered in March of 1930, the G-38 set four world records during these tests, including speed, distance, and duration for airplanes lifting a massive 11,025-pound payload. After receiving worldwide acclaim, Deutsche Lufthansa AG, the flag carrier of Germany, put the model into commercial service. Germany's pride and joy. By July of 1930, Lufthansa's G-38 began scheduled flights between Berlin and London, with a capacity for up to 13 passengers. Only a few months later, with the popularity of the Junkers model rising all over Europe, the model was taken in for upgrades, mainly to expand the passenger cabin. Construction lasted until mid-1932, when a second deck was built within the D-2000 fuselage. On February 2, 1931, the Junkers yard engineers re-engined the first G-38 model, upgrading it with two Junkers L-8 and two L-88 engines. This change gave the model a total power rating of 2,366 horsepower. In the meantime, engineers remodeled the second G-38 with a double-deck fuselage and a capacity for 34 passengers. 
Six of the passengers could enjoy the flight while sitting comfortably inside the wings between the power plants and the fuselage in scenic seats with floor windows. Lufthansa used the second model, renamed General Field Marshal von Hindenburg, after the famous general, to cover scheduled services within many European cities, including Berlin, Hanover, Amsterdam, and London. Throughout the decade, both G-38s became a source of pride for the German aircraft industry. However, the aircraft's manufacturing, maintenance, and advertisement tours came with hefty price tags. The numbers went as high as 2.2 million Reichsmarks and were covered mainly by the German state. Even Lufthansa executives spent thousands of Reichsmarks on the model, believing that the aircraft had immense appeal to the passengers. Both modified G-38 models continued to serve until May of 1936, when test pilot Wilhelm Zimmermann crashed the first G-38 model during a particularly windy post-maintenance test flight while gliding at low altitude. Due to extensive damage, Lufthansa had no choice but to write off the innovative and costly aircraft. Civilian Aircraft in World War II General Field Marshal von Hindenburg, the second G-38 that was later marked DAPIS, continued to fly with Lufthansa's fleet for nearly a decade, just as the Third Reich became more powerful. At the outbreak of World War II in 1939, the remaining Junkers G-38 were put into military service as heavy transport craft by the Luftwaffe. For almost two years, the model performed several distinct operations in the European theater. Then, on May 17, 1941, Adolf Hitler issued his proposed guidelines for the military government of Greece after conquering Athens weeks before. Directive Number 29 was a series of instructions and strategic plans issued by the Fuhrer himself, covering detailed regulations for the governance of occupied territories, their populations, and how the German armed forces would operate in the area. But despite their loss, the Greeks continued to be supported by the United Kingdom, Australia, and New Zealand. That same day, during an air raid performed by the Royal Air Force's bow fighters of Squadron 252, based in Malta, English crews spotted the Luftwaffe's Junkers G-38, and the second and final model was in for a grisly end, perpetrated by the Royal Air Force guns. KI-20 As the Junkers G-38 model performed trial flights in the late 1920s, representatives for Japanese company Mitsubishi arrived in Germany to meet with the engineers. The representatives expressed an interest in a military version of the German civilian aircraft, mainly due to its record-breaking size. After completing a pre-production design study for a Japanese copy, designated K-51, both the Reich Ministry of Aviation and the representatives reached a licensing and manufacturing agreement. To this end, a team of Junkers engineers and personnel were sent to Japan to support Mitsubishi. In 1931, a prototype was successfully flown in Japan by Zimmermann, the same test pilot that flew the G-38, and the first two models of the Mitsubishi Ki-20 variant using Junkers parts were completed the following year. Four more Ki-20s were built up until 1935. However, these were made with Japanese components and slightly differed from their original German counterparts. During World War II, the Japanese Air Force planned for the Ki-20 to serve in different transport and support roles, including as bombers. To this end, the models were armed with six gun positions and with a massive maximum bomb load of 11,020 pounds. Soon after, the German-inspired aircraft became part of the Imperial Japanese Army Air Force. The type's primary mission during the conflict was to attack the forts at the entrance of Manila Bay in the Philippines, as well as for deep penetration missions into Siberia. Still, during the type's service with the Japanese Air Force, several engine upgrades were developed to address the persistent issue of insufficient power. Nevertheless, the model's existence and the joint cooperation between Japan and Germany before the Tripartite Pact were kept a secret. As a result, the models were issued their out-of-sequence Kitai No. 20 until 1940, when the hidden cooperation was finally revealed. Lasting Innovation while Hugo Junkers believed the now extinct model would be the basis for his original dream of building a flying wing type aircraft with a capacity for 500 passengers, he realized it was not possible after much studying and research. Junkers eventually acknowledged that the future of aviation was in streamlined aircraft with a wide body and thin wings, as the oversized blended wings prevented the G-38 from being as fast as expected. Still, 
Hugo Junker's technology with blended wings was later considered and improved by both NASA and Boeing in the 21st century as an alternative to conventional tube and wing aircraft configurations. Despite not being conceived as a military aircraft, the Junkers G-38 technology that astounded the world did eventually participate in and influence World War II combat. Thank you for watching Dark Skies. Please give us a thumbs up if you liked our video, and don't hesitate to share it with someone you think would also enjoy it. And for more historical and military content, subscribe to all the Dark Documentaries channels, where we publish new videos regularly. Stay tuned.